Good evening, everybody. I hope you can all hear me well. I'm just looking to see if everybody's actually being able to view me. I'm showing no viewers at the moment. And I do see that I should be seeing myself because I'm also one of the viewers. So there's supposed to be a button that is allows me to enter the room and the button is not showing up so that could be a problem so what i may end up doing is i was having a little trouble with this the test cases google is constantly changing how they do things is i may go ahead and just do this webinar and then just make it available for a rebroadcast at a later time so since I still see there's no viewers and my second computer should be showing that I am on, I'm going to go ahead and assume that this is not allowing me to enter with other people. So anyway, so uh, right now, this uh, broadcast that we're doing right now is called Publishing a Book from Scratch. And essentially what this is, is taking you from being a published author or being a, actually a concept of becoming a published author and then actually going into uh, having actually a published copy within uh, the next, just it could be as quickly as just a few months. For me, it was about 10 months. So let's go ahead and get started. So I do want to say good evening to everybody. Even though this is a rebroadcast, you may be seeing this during the day. But I just want to say good evening, everybody, and well, welcome to this uh, to this event. To introduce myself, my name is Kevin Dunlap. I'm an author, as you very well know. This, this is the point of this conversation. I'm a, a professional speaker as well as a mentor. I am also the founder of a company by the name of Plentiful Perspectives. And I do want to thank you for your time. I know your time is busy. I know you have a very busy schedule. So thank you for joining us uh, this evening. And also, uh, I do know this is this is being recorded Wednesday night. However, again, thank you for your time. And I do know some of you are, lo are logging in from the East Coast. And I do apologize for not being able to see me this evening. But I will, again, rebroadcast this at a later time. To tell you a little bit about me before we get started, I just want to tell you who I am and why I, I'm actually doing this uh, broadcast. So you better understand a little bit better as to who I am as well as um, what is available. Uh, you know, what is it that I could bring to the table? To start off, I'm from a small town in the, in the, from the state of Florida by the name of Pace, Florida. As you can see by the map here, that Pace is um, just right there on the, on the on the corner of Florida, right here, this is also where Pensacola, Florida, is. It's the only uh, big city in Florida that is actually uh, that is actually in the central time zone. Everything else, all the rest of Florida here, is actually uh, in the uh, eastern time zone. I went to Pace uh, Elementary, Middle, and High School, so we only had one small um, uh, town. We even had, at the time I was growing up, we only had one traffic light, so we were actually a very, very small town even though Pensacola was actually pretty big. The, uh, um, after graduating from high school in, on November 13th, 1985, which happens to be my father's birthday, I joined the U.S. Navy and was stationed here in Great Lakes, Illinois at the Naval Air Station. This is where I went to basic training in my A school. As you can probably uh, surmise, the uh, Coming from Florida to Northern Illinois, where this uh, st this station is, is, as you can see by this, is here's Great Lakes. It's just right there on the lake itself. So we went from um, um, maybe 60 degree temperatures in Florida to well below zero temperatures uh, at the Naval Air Station. So this was a very rude awakening for me, as I did not have, I was not used to seeing snow. Uh, actually, even on Christmas Eve was was the coldest day of my life. As I was, uh, as we were marching to the Chow Hall, I do remember I was wearing like uh, three jackets on top of two shirts, as well as I was wearing two pairs of pants, and I was still freezing. Uh, they said uh, they said that the temperature that day was negative sixty four degrees Fahrenheit. That was the coldest day I've ever experienced in my entire life. Um, and then later on. Uh, after get, getting out of school, I was actually in what was called the nuclear power program. However, due to some incidences, I was not able, on the last day of school, I did not, I was actually removed from the nuclear power program because my GPA was just, too, it was just a little bit too low. I believe I had to have a 90 degrees, uh, 90, um, a 90, uh, um, what do you call that, a, a, 
a 90 GPA or 90 thing. And actually, I graduated with an 89.8. So I was by 0.2 uh, points too low. And I actually, they removed me from the nuclear power program. And therefore, I was waiting around in in, in the Great Lakes area for an additional three months. I did put in for an overseas billet and I actually did get to, to be stationed in Yokosuka, Japan. I was actually there for two tours, two two-year tours. And that was, that was absolutely, absolutely amazing. Just to show you a little bit, this is actually me right here as I was about to get my E4 uh, badge. And then this is me uh, as an E5 in 1989, I believe this was, right before I was getting out. And this was my Japanese girlfriend at the time. And just to give you a little bit about myself, I was this was the very first ship that I was stationed on. It was uh, the USS Reeve CG-24, which stands for a guided missile cruiser. Um, we had maybe 300 people on this ship. And, you know, I worked down in the engine room on this one. My second ship was the USS Blue Ridge or, or the LCC-19. And I spent another two years on this ship. Luckily, both of these were in, in the Yokosuka, Japan area. And I got to stay, you know, over. I got to stay in the same city. However, I was stationed on two different ships. Now, this ship here had over a thousand people on it, and it, and instead of working in the engine room on this one, I worked in what they call a gang or air conditioning and refrigeration. And while I was overseas, since I was stationed in Japan, I was able to see quite a few different countries. I and mean, this was over the course of four years, even though I was stationed in the, the Yokosuka area. And then just to go back a little bit, just to show you where Yokosuka is, you can see right here, just, just a little bit north, there's Tokyo. So I went to Tokyo quite, quite frequently now over those four years. So where am I? So I was able to see very many countries. So obviously I was in, I saw Japan, uh, and these are not in any particular order. So another country I saw quite frequently was the Philippines. And then there was South Korea, went to a couple of cities in South Korea over the, over the years. And then of course, China. Now one of the great things about China in 1987, um, when I was still on the, the first ship, the USS Reeves, we, I was one of three different ships that got to go to China. It was the first time that any US or American ships had been in port for over 30 years. Now, luckily, the second time Amer um, the American ships were allowed to go to China, I was on the Blue Ridge and we were again one of three ships that actually were, it was able to be uh, allowed to be in China. So I got to see Qingdao and, uh, and Shanghai while, uh, while I was there. So I was one of maybe four or five people that I was aware of that actually was able to visit China twice while, while I was in the service. And that's actually quite rare. The last cruise that I was on was we actually visited Indonesia. We went to Malaysia, as well as making an Australian cruise. This was the this was in like May of 1990 when I was right before processing out, and I got to see quite a bit of both of. Uh, uh, of this country of, of Indonesia and of Malaysia, and then we saw, I believe it was five cities in Australia. Now we hit Perth. Now this little area here is known as Tasmania, this little island south of Australia. It's still part of Australia, and you know we got to see that as well. Then we hit, of course, the Gold Coast here on the east coast, which is the, as you can see, the more populous side. Um, and that was that was absolutely wonderful to be able to see there. I've also been to Thailand a few times, and. Uh, Hong Kong, which at, at that time was still ruled by the uh, the English uh, system, now is part of China as of 1997. And one of the great things about seeing this country was all the how, just how much money that was there. I mean, almost every single street corner that I walked on, there was a Rolls Royce, a Rolls, and just they just outnumbered um, like a, like most of the other cars. The cleanest city that I've ever seen was Singapore. Now, this is it was a beautiful, beautiful and clean country. I absolutely loved it. I went there twice, I believe. And then, um, other than that, the, the one of the other uh, countries that I got to see while I was on my first ship was Bahrain. As you can see, this is just off the coast of Saudi Arabia. So o overall, over the course of those four years, I've got to see 11 countries. And now Bahrain is a little little island right here, so you don't, you're not going to really see it in the blue. But these are the other countries that I was able to see while, uh, while st being stationed in Japan. And this is Japan right here. 
So um, after getting out, out of the Navy in 1990, I went to Florida State University, excuse me, University of West Florida for my undergraduate degree in mathematics. It took me four years. Then I spent three years at the Florida State University studying physical meteorology, going after my master's degree, which I'd actually never completed. I'd never finished my thesis. And then while in grad school, I was able to, I got, fell into love in, uh, with film and doing stunt work. I worked on an independent film and then decided I wanted to, uh, that I actually wanted to do stunts. Because of that, I took up fencing. I did a little bit of skiing. I did a little bit of whitewater rafting. And other things that I did was I st actually started skydiving at that time. So it was just phenomenal experience when I decided I wanted to go to stunt school or wanted to get into stunts. I, I went and did that. L a little bit later, I ended up moving to Raleigh, North Carolina. And while I was there as a computer programmer, I ended up going to stunt school. And that's where I did things like doing, um, doing, doing a fire burn what was called a jerk harness. We were in this harness here, and in this case, I'm being yanked up into a tree or doing high falls. Um, this this high fall is probably about 30 or 40 feet off the ground uh, into an airbag. This is a cherry picker or, or just a lift that we're, uh, that we're jumping off of into the airbag. Now, the funny thing I wanted to mention about high falls is that you, let's say if we were 30 feet off the ground here, that's 30 feet to your feet. Now, if you, I'm six foot tall, so a 30 foot high fall is actually from my eyes is actually 36 feet high. So distance from the height is is um, is is quite different than uh, than 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 you would think. It's it's definitely a lot higher looking down than it does to look up. And the problem that I that would actually came across. Uh, during all of this is after I moved to, uh, after I was working in Raleigh, I was working as a programmer. I was jumping different jobs through a subsidiary of IBM. And what happened was that when I finished my one gig, this is when I went to stunt school. This was June of 1999. And what happened was when I got back, they couldn't find me another job. They, you know, they paid me for another month. Uh, this, this stunt school was three weeks long. So I had to take, uh, I had two weeks vacation at that time. So I had to take one week of unpaid. And then after about three or four weeks, my boss came to me and said that that he could not um, find me another gig. So therefore, he would have to let me go. Oh, oh, and oh, by the way, since you uh, did not uh, earn that second week of vacation, we could have to take that out of your your two week severance package. And I was already paid for the already took the one week for not um, for taking a three week vacation. So essentially, I got downsized with no severance. And I was at that point, you know, going through all of this. In 1999, it was just the most most devastating thing uh, in my life. So at that point, I decided, like, okay, you know, here I'm in Raleigh. I'm, you know, I, I'm not finding any jobs there. What should I do? Uh, I did a brief little time in Charlotte, North Carolina. However, that wasn't really panning out. So I was trying to figure out where is it that I want to live. I had three. There was three cities that I was thinking about. Uh, and one was Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina. The other one was, um, what, are you, what is that called? Um, uh, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. And then, of course, there was a, a small town called Wilmington, North Carolina. After a brief visit to Wilmington, North Carolina, I absolutely fell in love with this town. This town is actually a lot of small film industries going on there. As it so happens, as I was uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, checking it out, you know, trying to find a jobs and things like that, as well as looking for a place to live. While I was uh, standing in a phone booth, because this is way before cell phones, I came across a, uh, a, a an ad about a stunt performance that was going on that weekend that I was there that you know it was the following day and I decided okay why not go I didn't have that much money at the time this is going to be you know it's going to be kind of costly for me to attend this event for the money that I had saved but I decided to go ahead and go anyway and I'm so glad that I did because at that time I ended up meeting these guys this is a part a group known as Studio F and th this is actually taken at a, uh, at a what we call it at Anzea Festival at, at a later time, about a year or two later. However, since meeting these guys, I ended up moving to North Carolina and spending a few years there. I ended up becoming a math teacher. I was a bartender as well. I was just getting into real estate. I was uh, doing all other kinds of things. And I was also starting to do some stunt work. Now, this is me here 
um, at the event. This is my best friend, Michael, which is the guy lying on the ground there. And then Joey is this guy here. And this is me fighting Joey with a stick where he's fighting me with a sword. And as you can see, we're doing this as a live performance. Uh, so that was actually, that, ch that completely changed my life. I did a lot of stunt work and I learned a lot from that. And I actually implement a lot of the stunt work that I do here in my personal life even today, even though it's over 10 years later. While I was living there, in, um, in 1999, uh, or actually in 2002, uh, January 1st, 2002, earlier uh, in the, or late in 2001, I bought this program known as Personal Power. As you can see, these are cassettes. And this actually changed, uh, this is probably the, one of the biggest catalyst things that happened in my life that I could, I could not tell you just how important this was. Um, I started listening to this on the 1st of January, 2002. And this is a 30-day program. And in this program, uh, this is with Tony Robbins, of course. And in this program, he teaches you all about goals and all about so many different other things and also about financial awareness. And because of this, I think it was like on day seven, he said, before you can uh, do anything that you want to in your life, the first thing you have to do is you've got to get your finances in order. And, and when I did that, I ended up going out buying this book, Cashflow Quadrant, which is the second book of the Rich Dad Poor Dad series by Robert Kiyosaki. And this is the book that's taught me all about getting into real estate. And that's what I ended up doing. I want to say thank you to Tony Robbins for giving me that inspiration. In 2004, I made the big jump. I had audio, owned a couple of houses. I owned a small apartment complex. And in January of 2004, I left North Carolina on my way to Las Vegas, Nevada, where I currently live. Now, I when I moved here, uh, everything was going great. Um, uh, however, there was quite a few. I was also affected by the, all the tragedies of the real estate market back in 2007, 2008, and, and beyond. I bought a few apartment, com or excuse me, I bought an apartment complex. I had bought uh, a few houses here in Las Vegas, owned my own home as well. And because I was focused for about 10 years, just, you know, my nose to the grindstone, I ended up, you know, having a, a good portfolio of properties. But when the, the downturn uh, occurred, I lost absolutely, er um, I lost absolutely everything. I even lost my personal home to foreclosure. And that was by far one of the most difficult things that has ever happened to me. And, and uh, I, mean, I, I, I could definitely feel for you, for those of you that may have gone through this, those of you who have not, it is a very devastating thing. Um, at least it was for me uh, when I ended up losing that. I actually, I actually even ended up gaining uh, quite a lot of weight. I was up to 240, 250 pounds by then. Luckily, in 2010, I found PSI Seminars. PSI Seminars was the first live event that I had ever taken in the personal growth industry. Granted, I've already done Tony Robbins in, you know, eight years prior, but this was my very first live event. This was in February 2010. And then in 2014, I found Peak Potentials, which is now called New Peaks. And this is the, this is the company that I will just get to in a moment that has caused me to be where I am today, being doing this presentation that I'm doing right now. At one of the Peaks events, I found this lady named Lisa Sosevich. On October 16th through the 18th of 2014, I took her class called the Ultimate Sales Boot Camp. And in this class, she teaches people to become coaches and how to develop your own programs and online coursework. Ironically, four days later after that, I was taking a Peaks class called Train the Trainer. Now, in this class, it's all about how do you train from stage. So developing online coursework and developing your program, and then also uh, taking this course here of how to be on stage. These are the two courses, since I took them back to back, that made me decide to create my own online program. This is what my passion was. So in 2000, or in December of that same year, I created a company called Understanding Women Today, or from a mass perspective, which was to help uh, my, initially help my female friends to understand what's going on from a man's perspective, which could be quite different from what women um, looked at. However, later on um, in, uh, in December of 2000 or in 2015, I create, came up with a plentiful perspectives, which is my, which is a, just a de deviation of the understanding women. And 2015, I took another peaks class known as known as Enlightened Warrior Power. On my way to this course, 
this is when I read a book as I was actually on the airplane going there. It was called Book the Business, How to Make Big Money with Your Book Without Even Selling a Single Copy. With this book, I learned I learned just how important it is to have a book. It's if you're going to be a speaker, if you're going to be a trainer, you need the credibility of what a book offers. And this was the book that actually I'm so glad that I found. And that's what some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you right now. So this is what I found. I found out this was my calling. Now I knew I had to write a book. This is July of last year. I wanted to help people in general because I've been doing that because of all the personal growth and development stuff that I was doing. And I had a lifetime of often looking at things from more than one angle. That's one of the things I've always prided myself on is being able to look at things from multiple perspectives or plentiful perspectives. That's the name of the company. And also I had at that time nearly six years in the personal development courses. So I came across, so where do I begin? How do I begin with this uh, this book thing? So so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to uh, answer the following questions. The following questions that I think are going to be the most important that you need to have clarity on if you're going to be actually writing a book. That's the purpose of the rest of this talk uh, this evening. So first off, we want to find out what is the purpose for you in writing a book? Why is it, or what, what, what is it that you want to do with that book? The second thing you will, we were going to be covering is what is the topic of your book? Now, are you going to be speaking about, I don't know, dogs? You're going to be speaking about personal development, about hardship, about changing your life around, about, you know, what is it that you want to be that's the topic of your book? The next is what format do you want to have the book released in? Do you want it to be a book form? Do you want it to be an audio book? Do you want it to be a workbook? Do you want it to be a soft cover, hard cover? You know, what version of the book that you want to do? And for some people, it's going to be one, and for some, it's going to be different. So there's no right or wrong answer here. This is all going to be dependent upon what is it the best thing that you think is for yourself. The next thing that we're going to be covering is should you hire a writing coach or an author coach? And there's going to be pros and cons to both of that as well. The next is, what are the steps that must be covered when writing a book? What are the steps that you need to go through from point one, from the concept that it is in your hand, hey, that is, and then next, when you find it, get to the point of actually having the book in your hand. The next after that is, what do you do after you have your first draft? You know, what, you know, what are the steps that you're going to be involved uh, there? And then how do you... Uh, distribute or publish your book, then what are the costs that are involved? And you'll be surprised as just what those costs can actually be. And now you are done. Now what? What are you going to do now that you have the book in hand and it's done? Now what are you going to do? So let me tell you, this is going to be a, a, a roadmap of what I went through over the past 10 months. And this is the, uh, the copy of my book right here, Designing Your Own Destiny, Embracing Change Through Leadership and Love. Today I'm offering it, and I'll probably continue through Thursday since this broadcast will probably only be seen tomorrow, of, of the, the release of this uh, book, that, which is today on Wednesday, October 26th, as being my actual online uh, official launch. So let's go ahead and get started. What is the purpose of writing a book? Or is it, do you want to make money from your book or do you actually want to sell your book? And you may think those are the same questions. You're going to make money from selling over your book, correct? Well, the, actually those two questions are completely opposite. The book that I talked to you about just moments before called Book the Business, they actually go into this. Are you wanting to make money from your book or do you want to sell your book? Because you are not, those are completely different techniques. Now, of course, I came up with a, with a third reason that this could be is that you could either want to make money, you want to sell your book, or or for some reason, you're actually a therapeutic thing for you that you're actually going to you're writing the book kind of like as a journal to get your get everything out there. If somebody buys the book, fantastic. If they don't, no big deal. So let's actually get into this a lot more detail. Now, if you're here to sell your book, most authors actually only sell about thirty to fifty copies of their book. Most authors also only make about two or three dollars per sale. So once you count the, the printing costs, the mailing costs, the fees that a publisher would charge, even if though if it's maybe Amazon, you still are only making about two or three dollars a book. So let's assume that you do sell fifty copies and you're making three dollars per book. Woohoo, you just made hundred and fifty dollars and it may take you two or three years to make that. 
So as you can see, there is really no profit in selling the book unless you become a, a breakthrough success and you're selling tens of thousands of copies, which almost nobody does unless you're somebody like Robert Kiyosaki or Brian, um, I forgot his last name, um, or or any of the other gurus that you know out there. But even when they got started, they were only selling a very few copies. So if your purpose is to actually sell the book, then my suggestion is don't write it. There's no time. There's no reason to spend all the money and time in writing the book if you're if you're destined to only make a couple of hundred dollars from it. So what if I buy if you want to make money from your book? But the, one, one good thing about the book is that it's actually like a big business card. When you have a book and you hand it to somebody, there's going to, there's going to, there's going to be an instant amount of respect and credibility that you're going to be getting from that uh, from that process. Also, the word author that actually means authority. So the word author here is just part of the word. The word authority means that once you become an author on a subject, you're now also considered an authority on that subject just by just, just the sheer relation of the uh, of the two. Another thing is it does give you instant credibility. Now, now here's one thing. I'm going to go back to uh, the book is your business card. Let me ask you this. If you're an entrepreneur, when's the last time that you went to a networking function and you've got, let's say, 15 business cards? Did you keep all of those business cards? If the answer is no, you just threw them away or threw most of them away, then, then that's your, you're like most people. Now, when was the last time you actually got a book itself that somebody may have given to you and that you actually put it in the garbage can? Let's say they probably have not done that. There might be, you might have done it once or twice, but not as frequently as you do a business card. Now, most people may uh, put the book in their bookshelves. They may not read it. They may put it on their coffee table or even donate it to the library or give it to a friend. However, most people do not actually throw away a book. So a book is a big business card that has great uh, authority. And the next thing is it, it actually gets you into more doors. If, if you if somebody if, if you were an exe uh, executive or semi-executive and somebody give you the business card, you may or may not want to do business with them. However, if they give you a book, then that actually will get you a little bit further into people's offices. So this is another good reason to uh, um, to write the book and to actually make big money off the book. The Many authors are also professional speakers, so being an author will have to help you get on stage. For myself right now, as I'm just finishing up my book, the so the number of stages that I start to get on uh, is starting to increase. It's because of the book. I could talk about the interior of the book as well to, while I'm on these uh, stages. And if by giving your book away to the right people, not just anybody, not just some bum on the street, but by giving it uh, out to the right people does open a lot more doors. Now, it also it gives you a template for creating your online programs as well as your as well as your talks that you're going to be giving. If you wrote a book, say, on uh, women suffering, getting away from, say, uh, abusive relationships, now you can talk about certain aspects of the what the mindset that, could, that that person goes through in some of the talks that you give or radio shows that you are an invited guest on. So, yes, the, the book gives you a great template for creating those online programs and to know what you're going to be talking about. So now we come up. What is the topic of your book? What is it that you are uh, that you want to talk about? This is going to be things that. What are you? What are you knowledgeable with? Do you have something that you have a special skill set? And now I will say something about this: is that everyone is great at at least one thing. There's something that you're good at that you're better than most other people. And even though you may not be the, the the number one person in the world, but you're good at something that somebody else wants to learn how to do. I don't care if it's uh, cutting hair weaving hair, how you do, how you uh, make lasagna or whatever it is, there is something that you are good at that, you know, that somebody else wants to learn. Just keep that in mind. And don't belittle what you, what you already know. And instead, just be aware, what are you good at? What are some people that your friends may come to you to say, like, you know what, you are so good at this because you show me how to do it. Those are things that you could be, uh, those, those are going to be possible topics for your book. Also, what are your passions? What is it that you're passionate about? What, 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 what is that something that drives you? That you're uh, that that will get you up in the morning at, at six a.m. to go and just 
do something. I don't know if it could be children, it could be dogs, it could be charity, it could be whatever it is. What are you passionate about? These are excellent topics for your book. The next is, what is something unique about you that most people don't have but actually want? That kind of goes back to the, what we were talking about, what are you knowledgeable with? However, what is it that you're good at that somebody else turns to uh, for advice on? So these are other great topics. And then what is your message? What is something that you want to get out there to help other people with? Do you have that message? Does it, there's, there's something burning inside of you that you want to get out. So now we're going to get into the format. This is going to get more into the analytical, technical side of things. But what, what format do you want to have your book released in? Now, the reason I'm covering this now is writing a book from scratch without having some kind of end result already in mind is going to be a foolhardy situation. You're going to spend a lot of time just spinning your wheels and because you won't have any clear direction. So let's go and talk about the different formats that you have. That you have. The most, the, the four most, most common formats of a book are going to be the hardcover variety. Now, this is the, 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 this is the variety that when I first got started, this was the version that my that my coach was suggesting that I go in um, because of what he called the plunk factor, because it's, it's a lot thicker and, and, and it gives more authority when, when let's say you were to drop the book. Soft cover is also extremely common. It's actually, I believe, it's more common um, than the hardcover variety. So, however, the soft cover. Um, now it's it's not as it's not as thick and it's, it's not as distinguished as the hardcover. Then there's the Kindle or the ebook version, and then of course um, there's the audio version, which are the audio recordings. Now with the audio book, I don't cover this later on. Uh, it could be either you recording the audio, or it, which you hear like read by the author, or it could be somebody else reading the uh, reading the audio. I'm going to assume here that your book is going to be nonfiction that you that you're not writing stories. Um, for the rest of this presentation. So because uh, with a storytelling book, you may need different voices. If you're going to have somebody else read your book for you, then you have to determine yourself. Do you want to um, do the audio recording uh, yourself or have somebody else uh, do it? And then if they have somebody else do it, are you going to have the same gender or the opposite gender? Um, that's going to be reading your book. For an example, one of my favorite books out there is by Brendan Burchard called The Millionaire, the Millionaire Messenger, and he reads his own books, which is fantastic. I love when the when when author reads their own books. Yet there's another book out there that is called, uh, what is it called? The Four Minute, uh, The Four Hour Work Week by. Uh, by friend, he had somebody else read the book. Now, if I remember right, Fryce has a, a Tim Fryce has a uh, kind of a lighter voice. Yet the person that read the book had a very harsh voice, and the tone of the book had a very harsh tone to it. So the book person reading the book actually set the tone of the book, uh, for, at least uh, at least as far as I was concerned. And or you can do a combination. Now, for me, with the re release of my book, The Design of Your Own Destiny, I went soft cover and Kindle at the same time. And I do plan on doing the audio version of the book with my friend Desiree uh, here in the next few weeks. So, because because uh, I, I know my my preferred version of book is audio, so might as well have them all three available. Now, the next question is: Once you made all the, the, these decisions, should you hire a writing? or an author coach. And this, again, is going to be something that you will have to determine for yourself. However, um, for me, I did hire a writing coach, and I'm extremely glad that I did. So here's some of the things that you can get from hiring a coach. And of course, I have to go on a side note here. and says, if you look at all the great athletes, all the great musicians, all the great people out there, they all have coaches. Businesses have coaches. Uh, entrepreneurs have coaches. Uh, writers have coaches. Um, um, in, in many cases, uh, people that are more successful have multiple coaches in different facets of their life. So please keep that in mind when you're doing this, that you're not going to be trying to do everything on your own uh, while, while doing this. So why would, be hiring, uh, why would you hire a coach? Well, you could be learning from something who has already done it because most writing coaches are going to be authors already uh, themselves. So um, they're going to go ahead and be, uh, be or have already done that. And, and secondly, 
you can say they have knowledge on the steps involved to getting you to the finished uh, product and actually published. One of the problems that most people do is that most authors or wannabe authors never finish their book. I would say probably 90% of the people that start writing a book, if not more, do not actually finish that book. So it, it is a great accomplishment to do that. And having a coach in your, in your corner is, I think, is one of the best things that you can have. Also, they'll help you uh, keep you motivated. They'll keep just because they're a coach. They're going to be the ones that are going to be following up and ensuring that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Next, they teach you the techniques in writing that most people are likely are not even aware of. I know with my writing, with my uh, author coach, he, he, he the suggestions he gave me, I, I fully, fully believe that I would actually, I'll probably still be on chapter three right now if I had not actually heard this from him. And he has contacts that are already in place so you don't have to uh, gamble if the next person is good or not because there's, there's steps that you have to go through from the, from the concept to the finished product. And these are going to be people that you may not even be aware of and you already have somebody there so that has, that has guided other people and therefore they're going to have those contacts already in place those referrals let's say and I, and I just let you know i did and i'm so glad that i did so what are the steps that must be covered when you're writing a book well uh, i would start off with this because i have talked to a few other coaches uh, writing coaches since i've actually did my uh, hired my first one or hired uh, the one that i did and not all coaches teach the same technique so when you're interviewing them see if they you know this is something that you feel like um, that you can actually learn from one coach may say write the whole book and don't you know without any edits the other one will say try to get it more perfected at the front the front end whichever of these coaches that you more resonate with that's more to your style then i would suggest going with that one so definitely Definitely interview a couple of them. Next is you when you want to predetermine the approximate length of your book. Are you going to write a, a short book, a hundred-page book? Are you going to write a, a six-hundred-page novel? You know, what? How long do you want to make your book? And the length of your book is extremely important to know, or the approximate length, is, you know, before you ever even get started. Also, the, the next step is to create an outline of what you will be covering. This would include the stories and topics or concepts. What, you know, just write them all down. What are the topics that you want to cover? And then you can write your first draft. You know, once you organize those concepts into a logical order, then you're going to write your first draft, your dra first draft without uh, any stopping. And this was the suggestion that my coach gave. Um, so it may or may not work for you, but for me it did. And that's actually there. Go without the, write the first draft without without stopping, and do not go back and fix anything. No grammatical errors. No, no nothing. Absolutely, don't work on anything else. Just keep writing and writing and writing and writing. Your whole goal Goal is actually that you're writing this paper, this this uh, this book, to be probably one of the biggest piece of crap out there because you're you're just writing the first draft. Don't it doesn't have to be perfect and it should be per, um, be perfect from the front end. So just go ahead, write the book, and, and just and to be done with it. Then we can go back on your second draft. Then you can go back and fix those edits and, and, and make those changes, make those grammatical errors. And remember, you are not trying uh, to write a masterpiece here in the first sitting. You cannot write a masterpiece in the first sitting. Next is don't let anyone read that first draft. Don't get any feedback. Don't get any kind of influences on there because this is a piece of crap. You don't want them to read it anyway because it is a piece of crap. So don't 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 fall on the, the guys that you want somebody else to read your first draft. And to be honest, I had four drafts done before I was actually finished, before I went to the second step in the writing process. And my first draft took over a month and ended up with 30,000 words. However, my, uh, my fourth draft was over 60,000 words. And that was my goal when I was, when I was first writing it. I wanted 50,000 to 60,000 words. The reason is, is because that would actually, the 60, 50 to 60,000 words would make a, a book that's about 250 to 300 pages long. I think mine was like 63,000 words. And now my book is 270, uh, is 270 pages. And by the time I actually finished my fourth draft, I was already three months into the process. This was covered in December of 2015, January, February 2016. So I was th uh, three months into this process. And what do you do after your first draft? 
Well, this is where the steps uh, come in. So, so, I remember I was going with a hardcover book. So this is what I was told from my book, uh, from my coach. First off, you write the book. Number one is write the book. Second is you have a professional content editor read your book and suggest edits, rewording, or moving one section to another section. This is which parts of chapter three may be better off in chapter seven. And he will help a content editor will help you redesign your book to make it the best impact possible. After you, you're done with your uh, with your content, then you need to format your book. You got to realize, well, if you're using Word, you're most likely using an eight half eight and a half by eleven uh, type, uh, print set paper, but you're going to actually be converting it to a six by nine or five five, five and a half by eight uh, uh, book. So you need to have the whole book reformatted. Now, the reformatting or formatting uh, includes having chapter headers and page numbers, table of contents, and all the other little nitty gritty things that are going in there. Do you have any images that are going to go in the book? Are they going to fit? Do you make sure making sure that they're grayscale. So the interior formatting is a completely separate uh, process. After the interior formatting is done, is well now you got to work out uh, worry about the cover design. What is the cover of the book going to is going to look at look like? Now the person that actually did my cover design essentially said you want to make sure that your book is understandable and is is going to attract the right market um, if you were to hold it off uh, at a distance. Obviously the book has not been formatted yet, so she would say squint in your eyes and see you know acting like you're seeing from far away. Do you un can you determine what your book is about by just looking at the cover? The cover of my book, originally, if you saw it had a hand drawing what would look like a, you know, possibly a house, the actual image that I purchased, that house was mostly complete in the drawing. And there was also a left hand in the picture that was, uh, that was actually removed. And my whole thing was, I told my, uh, my graphic designer, is that I did not want uh, that, I wanted most of the house removed as, you were, as the house was being designed, his whole designing concept, but I didn't want people to confuse, to confuse the book with a real estate book. So that she had, I had to remove most of the white stuff, and of course, the left hand because it just didn't look good. So when you're doing a cover design, when you're doing a hardcover book, you're going to have what, what is known as eight faces. Now, the eight faces is if you look at any hardcover book, if you've got one nearby, you, I would suggest you going and taking it off the shelf and and, and looking at it. The first uh, five of the eight faces are going to be ju just your desk jacket. You're going to have the front cover. You're going to have the spine going to have the back cover, then you're going to have the inside flap on the front, and then the inside flap of the back. That's five different faces that you have to worry about. The remaining three faces are, if you take off the desk jacket, is what does the front cover look like, what does the spine look like, and what does the back cover look like? You will notice that in most hardcover books, that if you take off the spine, or take off the desk jacket, the spine will be, and you know, you will see the, the title and things like that on the spine. However, the front cover and the back cover probably won't have anything on it. It might be chromatic or monochromatic, uh, or just one color or two colors, just to give it a little bit of a feel to it. So what is it? How do you want that uh, to look? So if you go to a soft cover, you only have three faces. You have the front cover, the spine, and the back cover. If you go with Kindle, you'll have the front cover, and, it's, and maybe you'll have a back cover. That, that's going to be the, depend on how you get it loaded. After you do your interior uh, design and form uh, and, and uh, exterior uh, cover design, the next thing is you have to go to, through publishing. Who are you going to publish the book through? Are you going to use a New York publisher? Are you going to, and you already probably if you've heard of the Harry Potter stories, uh, she was turned down by multiple people before the uh, before she was actually picked up. And if you go through a major publishing house, they're going to probably keep eighty to ninety percent, if not more, of your profits from the sale of the book. Now they're not going to they're going to have you most likely have to buy a, a hundred or a thousand copies of your own book that you're going to have to self self sale on top of that. So are you going to go through a, a, a traditional publishing company or are you going to go through um, uh, another company that's, uh, that's, that would be like a self-publisher, but you're essentially buying their logo, buying their, their, buying their, their, their New York or whatever city they're from, a uh, publishing logo that would go on the spine of the book as well as the interior uh, title page. Or are you going to go completely self-published, like going through a through Amazon's thing called a Create Space, which is also known as print on demand, which I'll get into more about that later. 
Once you have a publisher, now you can go and uh, go find a printer and get what's called a proof done. A proof is the actual printing of your book, and with that proof that was sent to you, and you will look at it and say, okay, or it does the dust jacket, or does the front design, does it bleed over on, into the spine, or does it, the back cover bleed onto the spine, or the spine bleeds onto the front covers, or all of your images uh, nice and clear and crisp, or are, are your page numbers, or is everything lined up uh, properly? Now, if you go through a traditional printer, that's going to cost you um, a little bit of money to do that. Then after you get the proof done, if you're self-published or even going through a major publisher, you most likely have to go and order 100 to 1,000 copies of your book that you will sell on your own. Because if you're doing self-published through your website, well, you have to have copies of your book on hand so that you can actually send to your potential clients. Plus, if you're trying to get on, on event stages, you're going to have to be giving your book out to these event planners um, uh, anyway. Then you got to create an advertising campaign and a website so that people will buy directly from you, assuming you're self-published or even if you're not self-published. And then, of course, the next thing is if people were to go to your website and they buy a book from you, now you've got to uh, mail the orders for your books as they bought through your website, which means that now you got to go and put the book into a, uh, a packaging to, uh, and then uh, seal it, of course, and then take it down to the post office and mail it out. So these, all these little steps you have to be aware of when you're actually writing a book. Now, you may say, wow, that's a lot of information. How do I distribute or publish this book? Well, if you're going to go through a standard publisher, you will need to get accepted before they will even allow you to sell it. So they're going to be reading it. They may accept it. They may uh, have you can do complete rewrites of the book, even though you've already had the content editor uh, do this for you. And there's likelihood that you'll probably only keep about 10% of the profits if, if you're lucky. Now, if you do go a self-publish of a hardcover, you must individually mail each copy uh, yourself every time someone purchases it from your website because there are no print-on-demand for uh, hardcover books. So the next thing is, okay, what if you are going to be self-published a soft-cover version through, let's say, Amazon, and they will use their services, which is called print-on-demand for each copy. So right now, today being my launch day, the people that are ordering the soft cover book, it will be like one or two days for Amazon to print the book. They will seal it and glue it you know, with all the glue, put it in the packaging. All of this will be automated and sent to the, to the buyer. There is no warehousing of the book at Amazon. Now, of course, if you buy the book yourself in bulk, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have to obviously have to provide some kind of storage for that. Next would be, um, or you can do a combination of the above. Okay. I, I, now, for me, I'm going to go. I'm going to go through the self uh, on the print on demand, and I'm going to be able to have, having probably about 100 copies in my first print run that I can give to event planners or when I'm out and about at, at different events. I can sell my book that way. So I'll be doing self publish and print on demand. What are the costs that are involved? Now, this is where the scary pro uh, part of the whole process uh, can begin. I don't dis dissuade you from writing your book based upon what I'm about to cover here in the next few slides, but I want you to be completely aware with, with transparency what the costs are going to be and then what are the costs that I went through um, approximately uh, to get my book to where it is today. So let's just start started. My coach has said that you go to hardcover, so we'll cover the hardcover uh, cost first, though, because this is going, to, is going to be the most expensive route to go. And we're going to assume that you're going to be the partially self-published or the self-published. You're not going through a major New York publisher to, um, to get accepted and then uh, printed. So let's start off. Uh, I hired a, a coach, and he's a lifetime coach, and uh, they can range from $4,000 $6,000, sometimes more, depending on what features or uh, services that they can pr uh, provide for you. Also, editing, uh, content editing. My, um, you, depending on the length of your book, and remember, mine was over 60,000 words, you're probably looking at between $1,500 to $3,000 for a professional content editor to edit your book. Interior formatting, you're probably looking at about $1,000 for that to occur. Cover design, and this will be a graphic designer. You're probably looking at about $500 to $1,000 for just the cover. This is hardcover, so that's the eight faces. And then are you, are you going to have any images inside the book? And do you have to buy those images? Or do, or do you have to have them designed? Now, if you're buying images, you're going to have to buy the right. You cannot just go get a uh, an image off of Google Images and throw it on your cover because that's going to be most likely be a copyright infringement. 
So you're going to have to buy images from companies like Shutterstock or Getty Images. Uh, the book, uh, the one that I'm using for my cover, my book is through uh, Shutterstock, and all the images on the inside of the book, I had somebody on Fiverr um, uh, do those uh, do those images for me. And there was eight of them. And then if you're going to go through the self-publishing uh, logo, through the, let's say, the, the partial self-publishing, that's going to be another $500 or, or more. And then as they set up uh, the printing of a proof, you're probably looking at between two to $300 for them to download the images uh, into, their, uh, into their computers, do the adjustments that they need, and then do the, the, the printing. Because on, let's say on a hardcover uh, printing, it's going to be different than a soft cover printing because the because of the thickness of the of the cover is actually is also going to affect the, the width of the spine. So all of these li all these little nuances have to be considered. So the, the, the setup and printing of the proof, you're looking at another two to three hundred dollars. Most likely, you're going to need, uh, the average cost of a two hundred page book is about uh, ten dollars each. So in the future, that we that would include the shipping. So if you're talking about ten dollars each times a hundred books, that's an additional thousand dollars that you're going to need to also spend to get your your first set of run uh, done. So the total expected costs are going to be between nine thousand and thirteen thousand dollars minimum to get your book published, to get it in hand, ready to go, ready for sale. So now again, don't be overwhelmed by this because yes, that can be quite quite costly. This is what my, my coach suggested I do. He said um, he said that when I was when I was hiring him, I was using just disposable income or disposable funds that came out of my real estate transactions uh, that could because uh, I am a realtor. And and then I was waiting around for a few more months to get enough enough money to go to the next step. And then, however, I wanted to get my book written. I wanted to get it out there. My coach said to go hardcover because of what he called the plunk factor. So if you drop the soft cover book on the table and then you drop the hardcover book on the table right next to it, assuming they're about the same thickness, the hardcover will make a lot, lot uh, larger sound and a higher impression. So that's where the professional, you know, because it sounds more professional. It's the hardcover, it's the professional book. And he said, uh, and then he said, use the book to mail to event planners to get book uh, the book for paid speaking engagements. Okay, which makes perfect sense, which is what I am going to be doing as well. Um, and then you speak to sell uh, personal coaching and other products and services. Uh, you can sell the book at the back of the room in the beginning of, of your talks, as well. So this is what I, my final decision was for me. And you can use these. For, this is not saying that you should go this way. This is what I did. So, so you're aware of what, what is the, uh, the other possibilities out there. The, the book costs were coming from surplus income, which in some cases, you know, I, I just did not have. Business was slow at the beginning of 2016 in real estate. So I, had, I was just sitting around for, in some cases, for months, just waiting to, to build up enough money to, to take myself to the next step. So what I decided to do is I would just have to speak to a few other coaches. I, I decided to go soft cover cover and actually I, I pulled some people on Facebook to find out you know what is there you know, what would they suggest you know between soft cover hardcover audio or uh, Kindle and and also the costs are a lot less in the soft cover uh, realm so the, uh, let me go over the cost that I went through so I hired the lifetime coach four thousand dollars that was a year over, over about a year ago uh, editing depends on the length because mine was over uh, 60,000 words. It was $2,200. Uh, interior formatting, I ended up using somebody on Fiverr. Now, Fiverr, may, you may get good work on there. You may not get good work. Uh, I used a graphic designer, excuse me, a formatter that happened to live in New York City. The the next thing was I did my cover design. Actually, I ended up using the same person uh, from Fiverr. I bought the images and all the other, and the other graphics that were inside the book for about $150, and then with her, it was about another $150. As you can see, I substantial savings. I went to Amazon's Create Space, which basically there is no there is no publishing logo on there. There is no publisher on there. Now, I do have the barcode, the ISBN codes um, uh, from there, but I do not have any pu uh, publisher logos on there, which may cause issues in the later on saying, you know, if, you, if anybody's looking at this from a professional perspective, they're going to say there's no publishing logos and they may not take me as seriously. So I am aware that could be, that, that, this, that could be an issue uh, later on. 
and then set up and printing of the proof that talk about five to ten bucks uh, for, for for that because everything was done by the graphic designer and then it was uploaded to to uh, amazon's create space and then i would look at it online to see how it looked and it looked and it actually looked pretty good online so i ended up ordering the proof uh, of the book so the average cost of a 270 page book is about five to ten dollars depending on the quantity that you order most sales uh, will go through what's called print on the demand so there's no actual mailing costs uh, to me whatsoever now of course if I'm selling it on my website I'm buying these books at five to ten bucks and then I'm gonna to have to uh, sell them as well um, you know or sell them on my site so I'll, I'll, we have to pay the, the cost for uh, for the mailing as well as the packaging so overall, you're, I was looking at right around sixty-seven hundred, maybe seven thousand dollars that I have so far into writing this uh, this book, designing your own destiny. So I also also uh, I had my uh, person to also develop the Kindle version of the book, which also includes creating links for each chapter. And there was twenty-two chapters, and then there was five non-chapters, like the preface, that were all part of the book as well. So those were uh, also included in the Kindle version. And there is actually, this is the reason I actually finally went uh, to the soft cover because it gave me two formats, the soft cover and the Kindle, which seems to be what most people tended uh, to like from my own personal polling. So for the reason that is, the cost a lot less than a hardcover. Many of the books will be bought on Amazon, thus I get paid while I sleep. I just do my own advertising to have people go there. Uh, I, I also buy my own books that I can sell at seminars or where I am speaking. And I also wanted to get printed now, not one or two years from now, when I was just, you know, I would save up all the money to get the, the hardcover stuff done. It's like, just, just get it done now. I can always come up with a second edition. I can do a rewrite of the book, with uh, give it a different title, get a new ISBN, and, essentially, and maybe even do it under a pseudoname. Uh, who knows? And yes, I can always do a second uh, edition at a later time. So you are now done with your book. Now what are you going to do with it? And that is the million dollar question. That is the reason you must have your purpose decided before you begin. What is the purpose of your book? That was the very first question that we talked about. What is the, are you wanting to make money off it? Or are you want to sell it? If, you're, if your desire is to make money off of it, then what programs are you going to be creating? What stages are you wanting, uh, getting on? Who, who are you going to help uh, hire or, unless you're an Olympic speaking coach, uh, help you get on these different stages? What are, is it that you wanted to do with this? And so the million dollar question for me was, for me was I'm going to use this book as a template for my signature talks. Now, the, what I mean by that is, let's say on chapter seven, subsec, uh, section three, is a, whatever that is, is, is something I can actually give a 30 minute talk on. So I can go and speak on somebody's stage and talk about that. And I already have it written in a book, so I'm already familiar with the topic. And I can say, and in my book, in chapter seven, we cover blah, and then I can give my whole uh, talk based upon that now when I'm creating my programs those also can be part of the chapters or even sub chapters of, of, of your book or my book I could this is what I am planning on doing I'm also looking at creating podcasts based upon the material of the book as well and I can use the book as a template for my own as I just said as for the template of my own thing also for my own online coaching programs and also for my future gigs as a launch pad for my future gigs the book it for me is the first step to a love to a lot of greater things so it is it's, it's your launch pad it is your it's your it's your it's your everything it's your it's your, it's your foundation for going on to the next level so I do want to say thank you for joining me tonight. I hope I answered a lot of your questions. Hopefully the information I gave you was valuable. And however, there are quite a few, other, few, few other things that you need to be aware of and you need to look at other books how, and how they do that is, you know, what about testimonials or those extra pages in the back of the book, like the about the author, or how you could book me as, as your as your coach or as your speaker. Um, should you have a forward uh, in the book? And I was going to write that right now, I'm going to say, don't have a forward of your book unless it's by somebody that's actually famous you know your your cousin sue writing a forward to your book has no emphasis and actually will probably devalue your book than it does and giving value to the book so don't have a forward unless it's from somebody like brian tracy that's the name i forgot earlier or brandon Burchard or somebody that's respectable in your own industry
And I want to say thank you again. Again, you can please help me with the, with my book, The Designing Your Own Destiny. To, uh, to the, today, our October 26, 2016, is my launch day. Since I since I'm not able to do this uh, live, um, this is going through a recording. I will also include uh, October 27th as a as also for the discounted on both the soft cover as well as the Kindle versions of the book. And I want to say please help me in. And selling these books, not only for me to help me to get as the best seller, but also help uh, other people find my book. I mean, if, if it's only one or two uh, people are, uh, are buying the book, then it goes a low ranking on the Amazon searches, and and I won't be able to help as many people as I can, at least from the onset. Also, um, it's all on Amazon, and I do right now. My soft cover price is normally seventeen ninety five for the promotion at a forty percent discount. We're doing this at ten dollars and twenty three cent. That is the lowest price Amazon would allow me to sell it for. Um, and also the Kindle version, normally is seven ninety five. It's by the eighty two percent discount by selling it for ninety nine cent. For a paid version of Kindle, that's the lowest price that they would do. If you're forty part of Kindle Unlimited, you can get this book for free. Um, and you go forward to uh, some of your people. But yes, if you can, please help me get the bestseller by you know buying a copy of the book, even if it's the one dollar uh, Kindle version. And also, if you would leave a five star rating, that help, helps me with my ranking and it helps me get my name out there. So I want to say again, thank you for joining me tonight. I do apologize that this is a recorded uh, version of the call rather than the live version, so there's no uh, personal interactions. However, if you want to, please leave a comment below on the video, on the YouTube video, and I will be uh, happy to answer those questions for you or contact me on Facebook or if you know me personally contact me personally thank you very much enjoy your day and good luck with the writing of your book thank you